You're watching Shalom TV. And now please welcome co-chairs of tonight's 50th anniversary gala, Gloria and Harvey Cayley. As co-chairs with Ira and Inga Rennert of this 50th anniversary, a gala tribute is our privilege to welcome you tonight. We celebrate more than five decades of extraordinary accomplishments and dedicated leadership. This is an historic occasion for many reasons. For one, it puts this remarkable organization, <coughs> its leaders and professional staff in the limelight. It is usually the conference that honors others and works behind the scenes with remarkable effectiveness and deficiencies. Please turn your attention to the screens for a message from the President of the United States, Barack Obama. Hello, everybody. More than 50 years ago, at the request of President Eisenhower, your organizations joined together on behalf of the American Jewish community. For the half century since, American presidents, including me, have benefited from your advice and counsel. Tonight, I want to thank Robert Sugarman, Malcolm Honline, and everyone who's helped to guide the Conference of Presidents over the decades. I want to join you in saluting your past chairs, including my great friend Alan Solo. And I want to express my deep appreciation to all of you and your organizations for giving voice to the strength and diversity of the American Jewish community. I've seen it myself. I'm grateful for our work together throughout my presidency. Together, we've upheld the principle that each of us has an obligation to repair the world. We've stood up against anti-Semitism around the globe and against efforts to single out Israel at the United Nations. And we've made it clear that the commitment of the United States to the security of the state of Israel is unshakable. I was proud to welcome a number of you to the White House before my trip to Israel last year. And during my visit to Israel, the historic homeland of the Jewish people, I declared that the alliance between our two great nations is eternal, Lanetzak, and will continue to stand with our Israeli friends as they walk the difficult road to peace with Palestinians. So to all of you there tonight, thank you for your leadership and your partnership. Congratulations on 50 extraordinary years, and here's to your continued success in all the years to come. Have a great evening, everybody. We are now pleased to present a message from the President, from the Prime Minister of the State of Israel, Bibi Netanyahu. My dear friends, Israel's dear friends, tonight I join you in celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Conference of Presidents of major American Jewish organizations. For 50 years, you worked tirelessly, endlessly, to support the security, development, and prosperity of the Jewish state. For 50 years, you've worked to strengthen the bond between the United States of America and the state of Israel. For 50 years, you've represented the breadth of American Jewry and the depth of its commitment to Israel. In recognition of these 50 years of achievement, I'm proud to express the appreciation and warmth and love of the people and government of Israel. For these 50 years of dedication, I express my utmost profound admiration and appreciation. I'd like to convey my best wishes to all of tonight's honorees, to the past presidents uh, and current president of the uh, Conference of Presidents. They've been extraordinary uh, leaders, extraordinary human beings, extraordinary Jews, extraordinary Americans. And I would like, in particular, to uh, congratulate Malcolm Holmline. That's the one fixture. Now, Malcolm, you and I go back so many years, and I reveal my age and yours, but in fact, you retain the energy of eternal youth. You are 
I'm tiring and forever enthusiastic about standing in there in the breach for the State of Israel. Your contribution to the State of Israel all over the world, not only in the United States, has been immense. Malcolm, we've known each other for, now I'll reveal it, for the better part of three decades. And in that time, I've seen firsthand your unwavering commitment and dedication. I've watched you bring the American Jewish community together to give it a more powerful voice. I've witnessed you work tirelessly to strengthen the ties between America and Israel and discreetly handle many delicate matters. Malcolm, the Jewish people is fortunate to have you, and it's fortunate to have the stellar leaders who are the uh, presidents of the Pro Conference of Presidents. I count uh, all of you as not only my own friends, but as people who've been tireless and exemplary Jewish patriots. Friends, I, I wish the Conference of Presidents, and I wish all of you, another 50 years of continuous success. Actually, let's make it 70. Ad Mazal tov. Please welcome to the stage Holly Robinson Pete, who traveled to Israel with America's Voices in May of 2012. Actress, author, talk show host, activist, and founder of the nonprofit Holly Rod Foundation, she is perhaps best known for her roles on shows like 21 Jump Street and Hanging with Mr. Cooper. Please welcome Holly Robinson Pete. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. Well, when America's Voices in Israel invited me on a trip to Israel, not only was it a great opportunity to get away from my husband and four kids, but it was one of the best trips I've ever experienced in my life. For all the reasons that you already know, because Israel is so beautiful, but especially for me, because I have a son with autism and I have a nonprofit that helps children and families affected by autism. And I was just blown away at the remarkable benevolence of this country towards children with special needs. It just blew me away and I can't wait to go back again. I wanna give a quick shout out to Erwin Katzkoff who from America's Voices in Israel, who's at table 229. Hey Erwin, listen, that was an amazing trip and thank you so much for inviting me. So I only came to wish you the Conference of Presidents a happy 50th anniversary, to thank you for, for everything that you're doing and to just I just marvel at that trip and I can't wait to go back. I'm gonna take a delegation of families affected by autism and some of my celebrity friends who, who are affected and impacted by autism as well. So I just wanna say thank you. It was a tremendous privilege to speak to you tonight. Shalom and have a nice dinner. Raul de Molina made his first trip to Israel with America's Voices in Israel this past June. Please welcome the co-host of Univision's number one rated news show, El Gordo El La Flaca, Emmy Award winner Raul de Molina. Shalom, buenas noches. I am Cuban and I was born in 1959 when Fidel Castro turned the island into a communist country. My father was put in prison by Castro for 27 years. And I never got to see him until I was almost 30 years old and living in Miami. I left Cuba at the age of 10 with my mother and grandparents, leaving everything behind with absolutely nothing. Never seeing my friends again for the rest of my life. And here I am tonight speaking to a room of such distinguished people. Now, I'd like to talk about Israel. My wife, Millie, and, uh, and myself visited the Holy Land back in Yunus this year, thanks to America's voices. It was one of the most fascinating trips of our life. This coming from someone who has traveled to over 100 countries around the world. In seven days in Israel, I learned more than I have learned in any other country. We visited Israel from north to south, from east to west, from the Syrian border to the Gaza Strip. We visited the small city of Sesderod, where people every day live their life in fear a rocket landing from the Gaza Strip. I could never imagine how difficult it must be living that way. Aside from visiting all the holy sites, one of the most memorable moments was participating in a Shabbat dinner at a beautiful house in the outskirts of the old city. The meal started with 20 people and ended with over 100 joining together to sing Hebrew songs, creating such a warm welcoming 
environment that made us feel at home. What a great weekly tradition. I also learned firsthand about Israeli food, both at the five course Shabbat dinner and all the great restaurants around the country. By the way, the dinner started with 20 people and they served the appetizers. The appetizers were on the table for two hours. I start eating and eating and eating. Then I say, well, they're gonna serve the dessert now. That's when they brought the main course. And this is from someone that loves to eat. But the most important part of my trip is what I found in the Holy Land. This tiny country that had learned not only to survive in an extreme, extremely difficult place, surrounded by neighbors that are not your best friends, but have succeeded in becoming one of the most advanced countries in the world. And no matter what the situation, a country with its people are happy. From, Jer from Jerusalem to the beautiful hip city of Tel Aviv, I found smiling faces everywhere. I found an extremely young country that is always celebrating. Thank you, Markham, Erwin Kwaksov, and American Voices. This trip was incredible. And this is what I share every day with my fans, over 50 million Hispanics that live now in the United States. Thank you. I'd like to tell you a little bit also about something else. In 2008 was the first time that I went to Israel. It was Easter Sunday, and it's also Passover. It was about 80 degrees in uh, Jerusalem, and we walked for about four hours. At that moment, I needed to go to the bathroom, and everything was closed. I headed back to the hotel where I was staying, the King David. I got into the elevator, and I said, oh my God, I need to get to the bathroom. That's when I learned I was on the sixth floor about a Shabbat elevator. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, that, that's a tough act to follow. Uh, it is a great honor and pleasure to welcome you to this momentous and meaningful dinner. It is momentous because it honors the past chairs who have served since the last conference dinner in 1996. They have guided the conference and enhanced its stature in the country and around the world, and I am humbled at the thought that I have succeeded them. It is truly momentous because we honor Malcolm Honline for his 25 years of dedicated and effective service. Although I have been involved in the conference for a number of years, only when I became the chair did I realize the full scope, depth, and importance of its works. And it is truly amazing how Malcolm and a very small but very dedicated staff are able to carry it out. It is meaningful because as a result of your attendance and the support of many who could not be here, the conference will be able to continue its vital work. For those of you who haven't contributed or wish to add to your contributions, there are pledge cards on the tables, and there will be staff at the end to uh, collect those. Uh, events in Washington have forced us to adjust our program on a nearly uh, uh, hourly basis, even to today. But I do want to say that at the end of the program, we will have a very special guest speaker, and we urge and ask you to stay to welcome him and to hear a truly moving rendition of the national anthem at the conclusion of the program. I guarantee you it will be worth your while. And now please direct your attention to the screens for a brief multimedia overview of what the conference is about. The lesson of Jewish history is that every great accomplishment had one precondition, and that was unity. And the conference over its 50 years has achieved remarkable things by bringing together the resources, the expertise, the intelligence of its member organizations. We can bring everybody into this fold and to say that we can act as a community with unity, even with our diversity. When the conference speaks, the people to whom it's speaking, whether it's in the administration, in the United States or in Israel or Jews in South America or Europe or Asia. 
they know that this is the organization that speaks for the entire Jewish community in the United States because it does represent 50 organizations, all committed to the safety and security of the state of Israel and all committed to protecting the security and, and, and well-being of Jews all over the world. The practical record speaks for itself. When you look at the rescue of Russian Jews, Ethiopian Jews, Syrian Jews, Iraqi Jews, Iranian Jews, Yemeni Jews over the past decades, in which the conference played a critical role, often a vital meeting with a president or with a chief of staff or with a secretary of state at a moment that really turned the course of history. We have also helped organize a number of, of initiatives that are really very important uh, lawfare, which uh, deals with the attempt to delegitimize the state of Israel through the legal process. We bring leading opinion molders from the Hispanic community, the entertainment community, broadcasters, to counter the efforts of delegitimization, which we find now growing in various sectors of American society, the efforts to deny Israel its proper standing and its legitimacy, we are able to really make a difference. The conference of the presidents, it is a great success, and the achievements are clear. You made the Jewish view an accepted and respected one in the United States. The fact that the United States stands on the very first day of the State of Israel on our side is very much due to you. You and us can sum up these 50 years as a great achievement. This union between America and Israel is extremely important for the future of the world. And your organization, the conference, has proved again and again that if there is the one organization which can unite Jewish voice of America, that's you. That's why your voice, your leadership today, maybe is more important than ever before. I've had the privilege to work with the leaders of the conference and many of its members as mayor of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's physical, social, and political unity is critical to ensure the future of our Jewish state and the unity of the Jewish people. Past chairs being honored tonight, together with my dear friend Malcolm Honline, have been at the forefront of advocacy for Jerusalem in the United States and around the world. I want to congratulate all the chairmen, presidents, men and women who are partners in helping rebuild Jerusalem. And I look forward to welcome you all here again next year in Yerushalayim. I just want to say thank you to Malcolm Honlein and Conference of Presidents. They are reliable and powerful friends of people of Iran. I'm very happy to thank all the efforts, all the forces that have been working in the time for all the years so that the people now are in the land of Israel and in America and in the United States. I'm very happy to thank you. I want to warmly congratulate all those who are being honored today. You really deserve it. You are part of the history of the American Jewish community, and I'm sure that this is not a kind of a finish line. You will continue your wonderful work on behalf of your community, on behalf of your country, and on behalf of the State of Israel. And I would uh, specifically mention my good friend, Malcolm Online, I'm not sure that the Conference of Presidents could be what it is today without Malcolm. Congratulations to all my friends on the Conference of Presidents of major Jewish organizations for 50 years of building strong alliances and unshakable partnerships in mobilizing national and international support for Israel. Senior U.S. and Israeli defense officials will tell you our security cooperation has never been better and for good cause. I'll continue working on these issues with all of you, and I reaffirm my commitment to working with you to strengthen the U.S.-Israel relationship and make certain that Israel's interests are always heard in the halls of Congress. For 50 years, you've been an effective voice for the American Jewish community, a consistent promoter of Middle East peace, and a tireless advocate for a strong U.S.-Israel alliance. 
With the many challenges we face both at home and abroad, the Conference of Presidents has always understood that we are strongest when we are united. The Gallus theme this year of strength through unity is a belief that has been with the Jewish people throughout our history. Tonight, I'd like to congratulate the Conference of Presidents and Malcolm Honline for so many years of service, as well as our honorees for their incredible leadership over that time. We, as Jewish leaders, must continue this sacred religious tradition of communal leadership and Tikkun Olam for generations to come. Thank you and congratulations. The President's Conference has established itself as a voice of the Jewish community. And I think the challenge in the future is to maintain and enhance that and to increase and encourage the activity of member organizations. It's the highest expression of American democracy for people to be involved. American democracy allows minorities to have a say. And it's not something that we can take for granted. We have to constantly work at it. We have to continue to build the support of the American people so they understand why Israel is important to America, not just America to Israel. Who would have predicted 50 years ago that the Jews from Russia, Ethiopia, Yemen, Syria, Iran, Iraq, every, would come home? This is the prophetic vision. This is the ingathering of the exiles. And we've seen so many miracles in our lifetime. And if I can play a small role, and if I have played a small role in that, I think it's the greatest privilege, and it's the greatest thing that I can give to my children and grandchildren. No institution is more rooted in the principle of strength through unity than the United Nations. The Jewish community was among the strongest advocates of the formation of this international body. And even if disappointed or even angered by some developments there, we support the principles embodied in its charter. Over the last years, we've had the privilege to work closely with Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who brought new leadership to the international body. In fact, his first appearance in New York was at a conference event. Please join me in welcoming United Nations Secretary General, the Honorable Ban Ki-moon. Honorable. <clears throat> Rabbi Sugarman, Chairman of Conference of the Presidents, distinguished honorees, past presidents, honorable congressmen and senators, Mr. Malcolm Hornline, Executive Vice President, Chairman of Presidents of Conference, Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished local officials, ladies and gentlemen, and shalom. It's a great honor for me uh, to participate in this uh, 50th anniversary of, of the Conference of Presidents of the major J American Jewish organizations. On behalf of the United Nations, I'd like to express my sincere <coughs> congratulations to your great achievement during the last 50 years. The international community and the American Jewish community enjoy a strong, unbreakable bond. We share a common goal, a world of peace and human dignity for all. Our values are identical, equality, tolerance, and dignity. There can also be mistaking the distinct impact, imprint that American Jewish organizations have made on the United Nations. Some of your members were at the San Francisco Conference in 1945, helping to ensure that human rights figured prominently in the organization's founding charter. Over the years, we have campaigned together against injustice and intolerance. And every day, diplomats, UN staff, and all those who visit UN headquarters stream past the Isaiah wall bearing the quote that perfectly encapsulates our work, the command to beat swords into plowshares. 
Our joint legacy is sol solid. The question now is where we go from here. We live in an era of tremendous opportunity. We have the tools and knowledge to end poverty, hunger, and disease. We can support the hopeful, homegrown democratic movements that have sprung up across the world and enable the oppressed to realize their dreams of freedom. At the same time, threats stalk our future. A changing climate, young people without jobs, unresolved conflicts, including in the Middle East. That means standing strong against the extremists and all those who would incite or divide. No one, not Jews, Muslims, or anyone else should suffer or be targeted because of the creed they follow, the cloth they wear, or the other markers of identity. My position is unequivocal. Anti-Semitism has no place in the 21st century. <laughs> Too much is at stake to allow, or to allow such discrimination to persist. Uniting the world also means resolving lingering conflicts and containing the spread of nuclear weapons. The resumption of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations is a welcome step away from a dangerous uh, status quo. This may well be the last chance to save the two-state solution. We must also do everything we can to end the horrendous conflict in Syria and be receptive to openings that present themselves across the region. Ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to strengthening the ties between the United Nations and all of you here tonight. <clears throat> the UN Holocaust Education Outreach Initiative continues to work with the Yad Vashem and teachers in dozens of countries. And in January, we will hold the ninth observance of the International Day of Commemoration in memory of the victims of the Holocaust, the date of which marks the anniversary of the liberation of <clears throat> Auschwitz. Ladies and gentlemen, our world is changing dramatically, politically, economically, environmentally, and demographically. We must find ways to work together more closely and more concertedly than ever before. I trust you will do all your part. Our doors are open to American Jewish organizations across the spectrum of the work of the United Nations. I congratulate tonight's honorees and thank all of you for your support. Thank you, uh, Toda. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for being here and for your friendship. We will now present the 50th anniversary Strength Through Unity Awards, which bear the words, Hini Matov, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to, to dwell in unity. My tenure began in 1997 through 1999. It was a time of change in the political activity of Russia. We became the communication center between Jerusalem and Washington. We delivered messages and leadership. My mission is a mission that was given to me by Hashem not by any experiences other than being led to it, and by my mother. There are six siblings, and I don't know how many nephews and nieces went to Treblinka. 
have to remember that and remember the importance of maintaining a democratic state in the Middle East, and that's Israel. The Conference of Presidents has a responsibility, internally within our own home and externally. A, to be truthful, to have integrity, maintain that integrity, because otherwise you are worthless, worthless as a leader. We speak for the American Jewish community. There are times when the extreme left believe that we're caving into the extreme right. There are times when the extreme right believes we're caving into the extreme left. But what we're doing is reading the consensus of the conversation that takes place and the debate that takes place. And we have to evaluate that debate. And if you're a leader, then you have responsibilities to lead. And you can't lead unless you have integrity and have the confidence of the people you're leading. I'm delighted to be here to participate in the common cause which brings us together, the celebration of 50 years of inspired leadership and historic achievement by the Conference of Presidents who have been at the forefront of every great and good cause and where we, wherever we are, are your beneficiaries. And to pay special tribute this evening to Malcolm Honline, my longtime valued colleague and cherished friend, for his singular devotion, commitment, really his misirut nefesh over the years, his relentless commitment to the kibbutz galiot, the ingathering of the exiles, and who has been an exemplary leader in his involvement with American leaders, world leaders, and always as Amcha, as a man of the people for the people and to recognize and express our collective appreciation, our collective appreciation and singular respect this evening to the first of the conference presidents to be honored, Melvin Salberg, a distinguished attorney, a person with his wife, Anita, and I think this is something that bears uh, a mention, who is the father of four children and the grandfather of seven uh, children. I think coming from somebody whose family experienced horrors too terrible to believe, but not too terrible to have happened. This is, for all of us, in America, in Canada, wherever, a singular achievement. And to recognize, Mel, your exemplary stewardship and long-standing contribution to every major Jewish organization and to every distinguished case and cause. Indeed, we celebrate this evening the 20th anniversary years of your leadership of the Anti-Defamation League, the 15th anniversary of your leadership of the Conference of Presidents. We celebrate this evening your involvement in terms of being one of the first to speak out about the Iranian threat, for your involvement in counter-terrorism, for your involvement in the bringing of Ethiopian Jews to Israel, and this is something that I think we all owe you an everlasting debt and, and gratitude. And your struggle always for the welfare of America, for the welfare of Israel, for the welfare of humankind. And so I say to you, Melvin, and to your family, really, Yasher Koach, may you go from strength to strength, may you go from strength to strength in the unity and solidarity that reflects and represents uh, this evening, and may we all continue to be your beneficiaries. Kala Kavod. Thirteen Iranian Jews were put into prison because they were teaching Judaism. They were telling kids what it was to be Jewish. They were accused of being spies, spies for Israel, spies for the United States. And the real question was, what effect could we have to put the Iranian government on notice? Being Jewish is something that you have to stand up for and fight for. I believe in that. I believe the Conference of Presidents gives Jews a chance to see what can be done. It's a unique organization. Near the end of my term, I, I along at that time with Mayor Olmert and Natan Sharansky, 
had a major protest in Jerusalem. I think something like 450,000 people came and we stood on the wall and we made a speech. The speech was, Jerusalem should not be divided. Things stopped and for years there was no, no more conversation. And my greatest achievement as uh, president of the Conference of Presidents was the fact that we took Jerusalem off the boards as, as a divided city and not made a divided city. At times, I miss the calls from Malcolm Honeline at midnight telling me all the things that are happening in the world that are terrible. I remember every night before I went to sleep, I took me about a half hour after the call with Malcolm to relax. Malcolm, I'm sure, went right to sleep. It's the American people who stand behind Israel, and it's critical, and the whole world knows that. Thank you very much. It's a great uh, honor to be here tonight to join in the gala for the uh, Conference of Presidents and, and to salute Ronald Lauder. Uh, I've had the privilege of working with the Pre Conference of Presidents uh, on a number of issues in and out of government over the years with Ronald uh, and some of the others, going back to stopping the PLO from joining the World Health Organization and UNESCO in 1989, in 1991, repealing the UN General Assembly's Zionism is Racism Resolution. In, in 2006, uh, working to bring a, a meaningful ceasefire after Hezbollah's attack on uh, Israel, and during almost all those years, dealing with the continuing existential threat of the Iranian nuclear weapons program. I've worked with Ronald on many of these issues I've learned from him over the years, and, and he and the other conference chairmen have impressed upon me just how much effort uh, the conference devotes to the cause of peace in the Middle East and around the world. You know, we're just finishing the season of uh, Nobel Prize uh, announcements. This year's Nobel Peace Prize went to the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, which was an interesting choice. The Norwegian nominating committee, though, in the past has awarded the Nobel Peace Prize to private citizens and private organizations. And the thought struck me that uh, what better award could they make next year than to award the Nobel Peace Prize to the Conference of Presidents? <laughs> and, and if that were to come to pass, I can't imagine a better person to be part of the conference's delegation to accept the Nobel Peace Prize than Ronald, who has done so much throughout his career in so many respects in international issues. As President Reagan's ambassador to Austria, now in his second term as the leader of the World Jewish Congress, and so many, so many other activities. We know the cultural sensitivity that Ronald has demonstrated his deep appreciation of the historical complexities of Central and Eastern Europe, which have been killing fields in the 20th century. Uh, is a man of great uh, intellect and emotional commitment to the causes that he works for, uh, not least of which was the Conference of Presidents. He's a real embodiment, in my view, of uh, the theme of uh, tonight's gala of strength through unity, so it's my great pleasure and honor, uh, Ronald, to congratulate you uh, on behalf of the organization. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. leadership that is inherent in this group called the Conference of Presidents. There are people who are committed enough and talented enough to be able to make a contribution. It's one of the great privileges of my life that I have enjoyed to be in that role. When I look back on my life, I have to pinch myself for having had these opportunities. I was flat broke when I started off. I didn't know anybody. I mean, I'm an immigrant here. I grew up in another country. The Jews were the minority in Montreal. We would be attacked by French Canadian gangs on the way to school, which made me one of the fastest two block runners in Montreal's history. But that's what I grew up with. And so I decided I was gonna do something about it. 
The issue that really affected everybody more than anything else, what was happening to Israel, because that clearly was a very small country facing huge threats on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month, and year-to-year basis. I spent a great deal of time with the leaders of Congress and with the White House trying to say, hey, there's a case here to be made for support for Israel, which is a great ally of the United States, which is a democracy, which shares the values of this country, and which has suffered horrifically in the 20th century. What we do is we discuss all of these issues, and I was fortunate to have the chance to do that. It's never perfect, but there are also great achievements. Look at how wonderfully constructive and creative and responsible the Jewish community has been in every place where they are. They have lifted themselves up by their own bootstraps. Look at their commitment to community, to education, to faith, to the broader interests of the United States. If you aren't proud of that, shame on you. I was proud of it. I still am proud of it. I'm proud to be a part of it. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear Mort, good evening, everybody. It is a tough job in many ways to uh, salute um, the man who needs no introduction, as we have seen on the screen, namely Mort Zuckerman. As you all know, Mo, uh, Mort has a meter's touch with everything he has put his hand to. He is a real estate magnate, having built up the very successful Boston properties. He's a media tycoon, as the owner of US News and World Report and Daily News, as well as a media celebrity, thanks to his columns and appearances on television. And he is a very generous philanthropist. And of course, I will tell you, probably nobody you know, that his greatest claim to fame is that he is the vice chair of the International Peace Institute, IPI, which I happen to be the president of. As president of IPI, I am in regular contact with top statesmen and diplomats, but I've seldom seen a diplomat as smooth and as accomplished as Mort. As you know, Mort is a passionate defender of the State of Israel and of the Jewish people. And yet, when I've traveled with Mort across the Arab world many, many times, I'm always impressed by how much he is loved and respected by those who have exactly the opposite views of what he has. Let me give you a concrete example. Every year, during the busy high-level General Assembly Week in New York, IPI hosts a Middle East dinner. It is only for foreign ministers, mostly from Europe and basically all the Arab countries. The only non-foreign minister who everyone, including the Arab representatives, insists should be, be at that table is <coughs> you, Mort. And I attribute this not only to Mort's well-respected knowledge of global developments and his contacts in the Middle East, but also the fact that he is a true gentleman who engages with people of all creeds and all backgrounds with dignity, warmth, and understanding, and that endears him to whomever he meets. Indeed, Mort is not just the man with a golden touch. He is the man with a golden heart. While all of you know Mort's public persona, I'm fortunate to know the private Mort. He is a true friend. Despite his busy life, he is always there to give advice in good times and in bad times. And he is, I will tell you, a fantastic father. And he has a great way of communicating with children of all ages, like my 13-year-old twins, for whom he is a role model. Knowing what it is to have Mort as a friend, I can say with conviction, and I must admit with some emotion, that we can all be grateful that Mort is a friend of the Jewish community, is a friend of the State of Israel, and is a friend of the United States of America, and he is a champion for global peace. Ladies and gentlemen, 
please give a warm round of applause to a man who is a leader, who is a friend, and first and foremost, an inspiration to all of us. Mort Zuckerman. Ariel Sharon was the Prime Minister of Israel, and there was the beginnings of the withdrawal from Gaza. There were life and death issues, terrorists just walking across, murdering and threatening Israelis. Anyone that was Jewish saw it exactly the same way. The government of Israel decided to build this fence in order to protect Israelis. Some called it a wall. There were so many people who would say, well, Israel is partitioning and it's declaring borders on the ground, completely forgetting that it was done to save lives. What we see in retrospect is that it was phenomenally successful in doing that. The Conference of Presidents is definitely critical. It's critical in a quiet way. There is an enormous amount of behind the scenes work with the Congress, with the Senate, with the President, with the State Department, with the Defense Department, all over that's really cementing the relationship between Israel and the United States. It serves as a back channel, it serves as a source of communications, and it does it virtually on a shoestring. The American-Israel relationship did not just happen. It is something that we as Jews have to continue focusing on. It is of enormous importance. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. I am really honored to be here tonight, and may I add, particularly happy to be here instead of still in the Senate in Washington. <laughs> for me, a mere former senator to be in the presence of so many presidents, and Jewish presidents is that, at that, is an honor. And uh, may I say what's really impressive is because of the organization that we really honored tonight, presidents who are unified for a common purpose, which is to be a strong voice for the Jewish American community. I want to say two things about the conference briefly before talking about Jimmy. The first is that, in my opinion, you have to view the conference and so much else that has happened since the end of World War II as a post-Holocaust phenomenon. Because when we look back through the lens of history at the Second World War and the Shoah, part of the story sadly is that the American Jewish community was weaker than it should have been because it was not unified. As a result of the conference today, this community of ours, diverse as it is, is unified and strong, and in its way, the conference for 50 years, and I hope forever, will be saying never again, never again. <laughs> the second thing I want to do briefly is simply to thank Malcolm Honline. It took a very, has taken a very special leader to weave this diverse community and group of leaders together, and Malcolm does it because of the extraordinary personal skills he possesses, but also because he understands and is committed so deeply and personally to Jewish continuity and to Jewish destiny. So thank you very much, Malcolm Honline. <laughs> Malcolm said it, and we sometimes forget it. He said it in the video. We live in an age of miracles. We've been blessed first by the miracle of living in America, which has given its citizens so much freedom and opportunity. 
and respect. And secondly, we are blessed to live in a time when the Jewish state of Israel has been reestablished. But miracles don't continue automatically. They need leaders to continue to support them. And one of those leaders is Jimmy Tisch. Jimmy was born to a family uh, that, uh, w by, its, by its legacy to him, uh, would have enabled him to never have to be involved in public life or public service. But his inheritance from his wonderful parents was um, more than economic. It was moral and spiritual. And as a result, uh, he has served the American community, the New York community, the Jewish community in so many different ways. For, for two years, 2003 to 2005, chairman of the board of this conference, coming as he was at that time from being president of the Jewish Federations of North America. Uh, he is now the chairman of the board of WNET to give you a, a range of his service and chairman of the board of governors of the Jewish Agency for Israel. It is because of people like Jimmy Tisch that, um, that I am optimistic about the Jewish future and about the American future. I am honored to ask you to join me in thanking and honoring Jimmy Tisch. The most challenging time during my chairmanship was the Lebanese War. Israel had the right to defend itself. Without a strong Israel, there's a possibility that the Jews of the world would be mistreated the way they have been in the past. Lobbying against Iran. try to hold people's feet to the fire. You have to rebut the vitriol that comes out of the mouth of a man like that. I am the example of an American dream come true. Proud of it. I served in the United States military during Korea, got the GI Bill, went to graduate school. And I worked in the investment banking business, first for big firms and then having my own firm. I have had the privilege of working for not-for-profit activities, Cornell University, Harvard Business School, the American Jewish Committee, Conference of Presidents. You're representing the Jewish community as an advocate for Israel. There are 51 organizations as part of the umbrella group, and the president's job is to try and make everybody happy, which you can't possibly do but it gets a great deal done. When I was 12 years old, I was a poor Jewish boy in a small town in upstate New York. And I like to think I've never forgotten it. I am a privileged human being. You know, before I uh, introduce the honoree to you, I'd like to say a few words about the conference. Because, you know, if you think about it, um, it's been 50 years. And I don't think that um, Israel had a more solid friend um, in, um, in the arena than the conference over the years. And uh, it reminds me, you know, we've heard so many things about the conference. I'd like to share with you a story that I think highlights um, the kind of qualitative contribution the conference is making to the relationship. The story actually takes place in 1948 when um, Israel's independence was proclaimed by David Ben-Gurion and Israel started to receive gifts from all over the world from heads of states, appreciating the fact that the Jewish state was just reborn. So Ben-Gurion started to receive paintings and statues and sculptures and chandeliers and what have you. But one country in Southeast Asia decided to outdo them all. They sent on a boat a huge white elephant the elephant arrived in the port of Tel Aviv about three weeks after the War of Independence broke out and caused a great deal of confusion. We, the Israelis at the time, had no idea what to do with the elephant. 
First of all, there wasn't a zoo in Tel Aviv big enough to house the elephant. But more acutely, we didn't have a veterinarian with the previous elephant experience. It was a real concern. What's going to happen with this elephant? And David Ben-Gurion, believe it or not, in the middle of the war, has no other choice but to convene the entire staff and to ask them, guys, help me out here. What do I do with this elephant? Walked in Abba Ibn, who at the time served as his chief of staff, said, Mr. Prime Minister, I suggest that you write a nice letter to that king from Asia who sent you the elephant, in which you will tell him what my grandmother used to tell me. Begurin asked, what did she used to tell you? And Abba Ibn replied, my grandmother used to tell me, never accept a gift that eats. <laughs> never accept a gift that eats. Now, if you think about it, what Abba Ibn's grandmother was actually trying to tell him is that the ultimate form of love and caring is unconditional love. And Malcolm, this is what the conference represents to us, the Israelis. For 50 years, unconditional, uncompromising, unbreakable love, support, and friendship. And I can say this as someone who worked directly under two foreign ministers and under five directors general of the foreign ministry. We always knew, and you will hear from Israel's ambassador later, his first event, welcome Ron Dermer. <laughs> Israeli leaders knew always that they could count on the conference. And I know that it was mentioned that the conference is worthy and deserving of the Nobel Peace Prize, but I know that one prize you can already claim with authority, and that is the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Because to bring together 50 organizations to work together, I mean, you have to be a world-class chemist, Malcolm. So thank you so much for that. It was said in another very famous speech that on the shoulders of giants, we were able to build, to build this bridge. And one of those giants is our honoree, Harold Tanner, not only by his physical size, but also by his achievement and accomplishment. After an illustrious career as a private investment banker, he entered public life and served as not only the president of the AJC, the American Jewish Committee, but also as the chairman of the board of Cornell. He's still currently serving as the head of the conference UN committee. But his term, as you saw in the movie, as a uh, president of the conference from 2005 to 2008 with marked, was marked with great drama. It started with the tail ends of the Gaza pullout, continued with the Second Lebanon War, and ended with Operation Cast Lead, Israel's Gaza operation. Throughout your entire term, you presented us, American Jews and Israelis, with dignity, with pride. You gained, and rightfully so, the respect of every institution, every government, and every administration. And for that, I'm humbled and honored to present with you this, uh, this award. Thank you so much. June was probably the most down-to-earth, solid woman I have ever met. This was a woman driven by a commitment to Israel who wanted to give back and found that opportunity through Hadassah, advocating for women and education, both Zionist and Jewish. For June to be the president of the Conference of Presidents was the culmination of a dream of a lifetime. The voice of the Conference of Presidents still speaks the loudest. I do remember her coming to us to say, I've been asked and just an overwhelming standing ovation to say this is the most 
significant next step and how proud we were. Now, you need to keep in mind that we already knew, she already knew, Malcolm already knew that she wasn't well. She had cancer. She was in significant pain. I'm not sure how she did it, but there was that inner strength that kept her focused on the good and on the achievements. And I remember at her funeral, Malcolm saying, I love June Walker. She was an amazing woman, an incredible charismatic leader, had a heart big enough to share with everyone and whom everyone felt comfortable with and embraced. We, Hadassah, thank the conference for giving her that opportunity. And I think she's smiling down on us now. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity to talk about my friend June Walker. I have the pleasure of being one of the honorees tonight, but my favorite part of tonight's program is the opportunity to talk about one of my mentors. When I first came into the conference, June uh, was a member of the conference during her service as the chairperson of Hadassah, and she immediately welcomed my wife, Andrea, and I into the Conference of Presidents family. We were on a trip to Prague. Harold was the chairman of the conference at the time, and we didn't know anybody when we got off of that plane. And during the time we were there, June had that special leadership quality which made you feel at home, and you immediately sensed she was a person who had great skills in consensus building, and she became a wonderful friend. I too remember the day that she was named the chair of the Conference of Presidents, and I remember immediately exchanging notes with her upon her nomination. And she was so excited to serve in this position. But those of us who served with her in the conference, I think, were even more pleased than she was. Because we knew that with her at the helm, our voices would be heard, and she would stand strong for the relationship between the United States and Israel. And despite the struggles that she had with her health, she served seamlessly in this position and provided us with a real difference in the way the countries viewed each other. I remember being in the White House with her, with President Bush, and the wonderful job she did in presenting our position and leading our organization. And I learned so much from her when eventually I had the opportunity to assume the chair. Of course, as has been mentioned, June served as the national president of Hadassah. She was on the executive committee of APAC. She was an accomplished woman in many ways. Her history included academic degrees in chemistry, respiratory therapy and, therapy, and public health administration. And with her background in science and medicine, she of course was a natural to assume her leadership role in Hadassah. She was a driving force in bringing the issue of stem cell research to become a grassroots movement. She was a leader in the fight for the enactment of the Violence Against Women Act, launched educational programs on health care, developed national participation in two marches for women's rights in Washington, D.C., and has been mentioned, she was the second woman to chair the Conference of Presidents following in Shoshana's footsteps. I'm so delighted that all of you are here tonight to remember June and to share with Marcy our appreciation for her incredible service. Thank you, June. Thank you, Marcy. Right around New Year's of 2009, the Gaza conflict broke out, and I got a call from Malcolm who asked if I would like to go to Israel with him for 36 hours. I said yes. We agreed to meet Saturday night at Kennedy. I arrive, and Jim Tish is sitting in the airport lounge, and Ronald Lauder arrives, and then Ken B. Elkin is there. Malcolm, as usual, arrives just before the plane is about to take off. And we got off the plane and we headed immediately to Stayrot to see the damage that was being done by the incoming rockets that were being launched from Gaza. 
And of course, when you get to State Road, they tell you that if the siren goes off, you have 15 seconds to take cover, and it's very dangerous. So Malcolm and I were having a conversation, and the siren goes off. A couple of guys grab us by our shirts and drag us inside, and a few seconds later, there's a blast. And the person watching the computer who's tracking the rockets coming in says, boy, that was close and then proceeded uh, to a meeting with Prime Minister Olmert, having him report to us on the discussion they had had overnight with the President of the United States and what we could do to help the state of Israel. And I knew at that point that the next two and a half years were going to be a very interesting time for me. I know from my own experience as the chair of the conference that at critical moments in the U.S.-Israel relationship that the Prime Minister of the State of Israel would pick up the phone and call Malcolm or reach out to me. The lead officials in the American administration would call me or Malcolm, I'm sure, at all hours of the day and night to ask for our input and our advice. When the conference speaks for all of these organizations, it's a very, very powerful statement because we are able to form consensus positions, because on the big issues we are able to stay together, we can be a force much larger than our numbers. And it's important for the leadership of the conference to constantly remind the individual organizational leaders to stand together to deliver a message of unity on matters that are really important. Well, hello, everybody. I snuck out of Washington. As you know, there's nothing much happening over there anyway these days. Jumped on a plane and hoped there would be no votes, and fortunately or unfortunately, I, I wasn't disappointed. You know, being up here with having all these giants uh, behind me is really a very, very humbling experience. I know them all. I've watched them through the years. The selflessness, the hard work, the dedication that all of these honorees have had is just really, really something to behold. This organization is now 50 years old. An organization doesn't last for 50 years if it hasn't been effective in doing its job. And this is an organization that certainly has been effective, not only for American Jewry, but for Jewry around the world, and I would say for everyone around the world. And I'm so happy to be here tonight and so proud uh, to be a part of it. Malcolm Honlein, he's been talked about all evening. You know, the direction always comes from the top. Malcolm is a good friend of mine. I've seen him firsthand for many, many, many years how much he cares, how hard he works, how this organization is what it is because of him and all the people uh, behind me on the stage. So I really just want to say thank you all, and I'd like to give you another round of applause. I want to also bring greetings from the House Foreign Affairs Committee and our chairman, Ed Royce, as well. And, um, you know, I started to look at Alan's record. I know Alan for many, many years. He's a very, very wonderful person, a warm Hamish guy. He's really somebody that you can really get friendly with, a good friend of President Obama. But when you look at what he's actually accomplished, he served as chairman of this organization from 2009 to 2011. Uh, during that time, he led this organization at a time of transition in governments from both Israel and the United States. He was president of the Jewish Community Centers Organization before he became president of the conference. He has um, uh, been chairman of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Chicago, a chair of the JCC Association of North America. Uh, I can go on and on with all the things that he's done, but I think you kind of get the understanding. So, what more can you say about him? I know his wife, Andrea, is proud of him. His son, Sam, who's a friend of mine, and Scarlett and Chloe, his other two children, are very, very proud of him. We can all be very, very proud that our community uh, has produced a giant like Alan Salo, and I'm very, very honored to be able to give him this award today. Congratulations, Alan.
The President's Conference is an organization that can be influential not only about Israel, but with respect to problems that Jews experience all over the world. In 1973, a trip to Russia with a very well-known writer named Joseph Telushkin very much solidified my interest in Jewish political life. We brought Hebrew books. Copies of each book were confiscated. The atmosphere was tense. We knew people were following us. We got phone calls in the middle of the night. During the time I was chairman, I went to the former Soviet Union many, many times. It's astonishing how life changed. They went from being virtually unable to express themselves or at great danger to express themselves to being free Jews around the world. The President's Conference can unite a powerful constituency in the United States to do a job the Iranian threat is now, right now, perceived as surely the most important existential threat to the existence of Israel, to the existence of Jews, and in many ways to the existence of Western values. We have educated the American Jewish community, the Congress of the United States, to the executive branch. We have made them face the horrors that an Iranian nuclear capability could bring about. The Jewish community is crystallized around this issue. We are one people. The unity of the Jewish people is something that you can understand from incredibly divergent views. And that's really what the President's Conference tries to harness in its effort to help Jews worldwide and particularly to help the situation of Israel. It is really a great honor for me to be here tonight as the Conference of Presidents celebrates its golden anniversary in the Golden Medina. What you have done and what you have all seen uh, is truly remarkable. It is not easy to lead the Jewish people. We are a tough, tough people to lead. Even in good times, we tend to see the glass as 1 16th empty. But in bad times, in bad times, it gets really hard because of our passion, because of our commitment. The horses tend to gallop in all sorts of directions. And the fact that the Conference of Presidents has succeeded in corralling all of this passion into enabling the Jewish people in the United States to speak with one voice is truly remarkable. I'm here, first of all, Malcolm, to salute you on behalf of the government of Israel. Had you succeeded in enabling the American Jewish community to speak with one voice for three months, you would have been entitled to this celebration that we're having tonight. But you succeeded in doing it for three decades. And so I'm, I'm thinking that we're going to nominate you to be the first face on the Jewish Mount Rushmore. <laughs> I'm also here to salute Richard Stone, who I've gotten to know over the last couple of years. Now, it's very hard for me to introduce Richard Stone, and I'll tell you why. I have listened to about a 1,000 introductions of the Prime Minister of Israel over the course of my 13 years with him. Without a doubt, the two best introductions that I've ever heard were the introductions given by you, Richard, in Jerusalem when the conference came. And those introductions said as much about the Prime Minister but they said something else, much more important. They said a lot about you, about what you stand for. And the greatest compliment that I can pay you is something very simple. Richard Stone is a serious man. We are in a serious time in the history of the Jewish people. And Richard Stone knows how important it is to have serious leadership. He knows how important it is the seri and how serious the responsibility is that the Prime Minister of Israel bears in Jerusalem in trying to secure the Jewish future. And he knows how important it is to have serious leadership in the United States. What I have seen tonight for the last half hour in all of these presentations is how serious the leadership of the American Jewish community is. And when I look 
in between this American flag and that Israeli flag, and I think about the leadership the Jewish people today have in Jerusalem and the leadership that the Jewish people have on this stage, I have no doubt that the future of the Jewish people is going to be very, very secure. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, for our next special presentation, please welcome the grandchildren of Frady and Malcolm Honline. We are here tonight to honor our grandfather, Malcolm Honline, for his role as a... What's his title again? I think it's the president of the conference. No, it's the executive vice president. Oh, I think it's the major American president. We know what, we know what, what it is. is. He's, He's the executive vice chairman of the conference, of president of a major American Jewish organization. And he's also... Although your title is long and complicated, it is easy for us to understand all the amazing work that you do on behalf of the Jewish people. We also know that you're the world's best tickler, card player, and overall super fun Saba. Saba, even with your hectic schedule, you make us feel like we are the most important part of your life. We are so proud and grateful, Bubby and Saba, to be our grandchildren. We love you. As the oldest of the whole nine grandchildren, I've been asked to say a few words in honor of our grandfather, Saba. The special tribute that Saba is receiving tonight recognizes his more than 40 years of continuous and incomparable dedication and sacrifice on behalf of Jewish causes, both domestically and internationally, with the ever-present support of our dear grandmother, Bubby. Saba, your commitment to the strength and the well-being of the United States, the State of Israel, and the entire Jewish nation is legendary. Having lived in Jerusalem the past two years, it would be easy to assume that this option was available to Jews throughout the generations. However, we have learned from you never to take this for granted, to instead appreciate the fact that today, Israel is a Jewish state, with Jerusalem as its capital, and to strive to ensure that this remained the case for future generations. By caring for others as much as our own, you have shown us by example how to be both a proud Jew and a good citizen. While you have been described by American officials as the most influential private citizen in foreign affairs, and having influenced Jewish affairs over the past 40 years more than any other non-governmental person, what we love and admire about you most is that the same passion you have for your work, you weekly apply towards your family. Regardless of the immense responsibilities and pressures that are ever present on your shoulders, and your 18 hour a day, six day a week work schedule, we know that you are and always will be there for us. Spending Chagim, holidays, and vacations with you and Bubby is a true gift which we will all cherish forever. While you are heard by countless people on your weekly national radio shows and your many speeches given around the world, our personal discussions with you are the most important to us. One of your favorite quotes is from Samson Rafal Hirsch, the great 19th century German rabbi, who said that a person is not judged based on his children, but based on his grandchildren. We believe that the flip side to this stands true as well. That is, a person must not look just at his parents as role models, but we also must look at our grandparents. We have had the unique privilege of witnessing firsthand your work on behalf of individuals and communities while taking on the toughest of adversaries. As Malcolm and Freddie Holmes' grandchildren, my cousins, siblings, and I have, had, have been blessed to have such truly amazing grandparents serve as our role models. So I get the only one who gets a chance to answer because I wrote the program. <laughs> but I did not want anybody to present, and frankly, it wasn't my idea, it was Bob's. And I have to tell you, Bob, it was a good idea. You were right. Because, because of the very special guest speaker we have, I'm not gonna talk long, we're gonna have and hope everybody will be patient because we are on time, Jimmy Tish, and we are gonna end on time early and give you, I hope, a real idea of what the conference is about. My grandchildren are the reason we are here. Your grandchildren are the reason we are here. Because they represent the continuity 
the commitment to the things that we care about. Human beings are the only species that relates to a third generation. Many animals relate to their children, but very few to their grandchildren. For us, this is very special. My grandparents couldn't have been here because they died in Auschwitz and other camps. My grandchildren are the ultimate answer to those who sought to deny us a future and those to die today who seek to deny us even a past. They know if you cut off our past, you cut off our future. I worry about the kind of world they will live in and my obligation to provide a safe and secure future for them and for all children. I'm grateful for all those who offered to speak, but I felt, as Bob suggested, that their message would ring stronger, not about me, and this is not about me. This is about an amazing group of people that any community would be proud to point to as their leaders. Look at them and we should extol them. Too easy it is to knock and denigrate those who sacrificed so much, two years of their lives and more, and continue to be involved. Our generation will hold us to account for what we do or for what we fail to do. Martin Luther King said, we won't be judged by the attacks of our enemies, but by the silence of our friends. It's what we do. It's the lessons that we learned from the past, the lessons of the 50 years of the conference. When we first launched this dinner, I have to tell you that we were very skeptical. We thought, would we get 400 people, 500 people? Who would have thought 1,200 people and we had to turn away many? And not one of you, no one knew what the program would be. You came because you cared. You came because you understood what the conference is about. And we're still a few hundred thousand short of our ultimate goal, so those who see those notes. But more importantly, we want you to be involved. When I suggested this, I will tell you this briefly. Jerry Gershom of the Friends of the IDF saw me at a dinner and he said, you guys can't handle it, we'll handle the arrangements. John Ruskay of UJ Federation said, we'll help you out. Israel Bonds, so many others, people who volunteered, old staff, Heather T uh, Jacobson and Malki Tanemam came back and joined under the leadership of Carolyn, who's responsible for all of the things that happened in the conference, together with Jill and Ilana and Alexandra and Sam and our ultimate volunteers and, and Lara, our intern, and Alora, our intern, and Judy Shapiro and Rabbi Myers. That is the whole conference staff. And the money we raise is not going to raise that staff. We're going to be lean and mean. It's going to go to the projects to assure a better future. When the Cayleys and Renards responded as they did immediately, it inspired us. When others came and volunteered and helped us and gave us advice in designing the invitations to all the other aspects, and we will thank them all a little bit later, the idea of this program came to fruition. It says a lot about this generation. We see the headlines that criticize. This puts a lie to it. We are united. We are one. Despite our differences, we understand our responsibilities to the past, and we understand our responsibilities to the future. Each of us can change the world. The leaders behind us did it in small and big ways, ways that we cannot show you on the screen. You've heard from some. You will hear from some other remarkable people including a leader of the Coptic community came to be with us tonight because very few people are standing up and saying never again when Christians are massacred across the Middle East. The Conference of Presidents does. And we speak up for others because we want them to speak up for us. That's what never again means. As Joe Lieberman pointed out, it's not a hollow phrase. It's a pledge to our children and our grandchildren that we will learn the lessons of the past so they will have a better future. It is Ira and my pleasure to serve as co-chairs of the 50th anniversary gala along with Harvey and Gloria Cayley. The theme of strength through unity is reflected by those who have appeared this evening, starting with a message from President Obama as well as a wide array of leaders from every sector of society in attendance. The presence of our distinguished guest speaker underscores both the message of unity represented by the conference, as well as close relationship it has enjoyed with American and world leaders. 
Even before his election, our guest speaker established a relationship with the conference, and during his tenure, he grew consistently closer with the chairman and Markham. This was manifest in many ways, especially in his support for the special US-Israeli relationship. The war on terror and in standing for America's national commitments and international responsibilities. We are truly honored that he came from Texas to be with us tonight. It is with my absolute greatest pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush. Thank you all. Okay, sit down. So I'm sitting down in Dallas, which, by the way, is the true promised land. <laughs> and Malcolm says, why don't you come up here to New York? I said, Malcolm, I don't want to go to New York. He said, no, you got to come up here and help us celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Conference of Presidents of Major Jewish Organizations. I'm saying it's not a bad idea. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Ira and Inga for facilitating my travel. So I got off the plane, and it kind of reminded me of Marine One. <laughs> I also want to thank uh, the Kayleys as well for hosting this event. Uh, and, and I want to thank my pal Malcolm. I've, I've known Malcolm a long time. And I, I truly appreciate it. Obviously, they don't have term limits for this organization. <laughs> uh, but one of these days, you're going to figure out what it feels like to be retired, and it's not all that bad. Uh, I, I want to thank Bob Sugarman, and I want to congratulate the honorees here tonight. I know that uh, Ron Dermer here is the uh, ambassador um, uh, Mr. Ambassador, when I knew you, you weren't Mr. Ambassador. Of course, when you knew me, I wasn't Mr. President. <laughs> anyway, Ron, I'm proud to be with you, and I also want to uh, pay tribute to a guy who I came to admire a lot. Uh, you know, sometimes there's a, a shortage of courage in Washington, but Joe Lieberman was most, one of the most courageous legislators and public servants. And like me, he married well. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I mean, I look at Lieberman, and I realize I do miss some things about Washington. I mean, I miss not having to stop at stoplights. <laughs> I miss saluting people who volunteer uh, to wear our nation's uniform. I mean, I have great admiration for the United States military. <laughs> And I miss people like Lieberman, Joe Lieberman. And, uh, but other than that, I don't miss much. <laughs> and I, I really uh, don't miss the limelight. I mean, I had all the fame and power you could possibly want, and I don't want any more. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's good for our country to have a former president bloviating and undermining the current president. I think it's bad for the country, and I think it's bad for the presidency. <laughs> And whilst I'm no shrinking violet when it comes to my beliefs, uh, poor Laura has to listen to him a lot. <laughs> I have been through a lot. You know, I've had a stent, I had back surgery. I'm now an oil painter. But most importantly, I'm a grandfather. <laughs> grandfather to a kid who's born in New York City. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. But, uh, and she's doing well. I must confess, I'm smitten. I'm totally in love. All it took was one smile, and I'm hooked. 
At any rate, I bring greetings from Laura, and I'm thrilled to be with you. Here's what I want to tell you. I want to tell you the Conference of Presidents is an important organization. It matters a lot to uh, our nation. I mean, one of the things presidents cannot do is isolate yourself from other people's opinions. I mean, the tendency, by the way, is when you're in the Oval Office to kind of rely upon the four people you see every day. I mean, it's much more convenient and much more comfortable. Uh, but the Council of Presidents uh, made sure that wasn't the case on, for example, the issue of Israel. And these men came to see me, and guess what? They had a lot of opinions, and they weren't afraid to share them. But the thing I always came away from the meetings was, one, they were very professional, two, very knowledgeable, and three, very respectful of the office. And for that, I want to thank you for your time when you came to see me in Washington, D.C. I'm confident we didn't always agree on tactics, but on some big items we did agree. And these are strategic thoughts that are essential for our country today and our country tomorrow, starting with this thought, that we have no greater friend in the Middle East than Israel. And a strong and vibrant Israel is necessary for our national security as well as for the establishment of peace. And that the United States must be a reliable partner to the true functioning democracy of Israel. And when it says we're your ally, it must mean we're your ally in all shapes and forms and policies. So I had the honor of speaking to the Knesset on the 60th anniversary of the State of Israel. It was, uh, it, it was one of the highlights of my presidency. I wasn't sure how profound I was going to be today, so what I decided, I reread the speech. And I want to share some thoughts with you. This anniversary is a time to reflect on the past. This is what I'm telling the Knesset. It's also an opportunity to look to the future. As we go forward, our alliance will be guided by clear principles, shared convictions, rooted in moral clarity, and unswayed by popularity polls or the shifting opinions of international elites. We believe in the matchless value of every man, woman, and child. So we insist that the people of Israel have the right to a decent, normal, and peaceful life, just like the citizens of every other nation. We believe that democracy is the only way to ensure human rights. So we consider it a source of shame that the United Nations routinely passes more human rights resolutions against the freest democracy in the Middle East than any other nation in the world. We believe that religious liberty is fundamental to a civilized society. So we condemn anti-Semitism in all forms, whether by those who openly question Israel's right to exist or by others who quietly excuse them. We believe that free people should strive and sacrifice for peace. So we applaud the courageous choices Israel's leaders have made. We also believe that nations have a right to defend themselves and that no nation should ever be forced to negotiate with killers pledged to its destruction. We believe that targeting innocent lives to achieve political objectives is always and everywhere wrong. So we stand together against terror and extremism, and we will never let down our guard or lose our resolve. The fight against terror and extremism is the defining challenge of our time. It is more than a clash of arms. It is a clash of visions, a great ideological struggle. On the one side are those who defend the ideals of justice and dignity with the power of reason and truth. On the other side are those who pursue a, pursue a narrow vision of cruelty and control by committing murder, inciting fear, 
and spreading lies. This struggle is waged with the technology of the 21st century, but at its core, it is an ancient battle between good and evil. The killers claim the mantle of Islam, but they are not religious men. No one who prays to the God of Abraham could strap a suicide vest to an innocent child or blow up guiltless guests at a Passover Seder or fly planes into office buildings filled with unsuspecting workers. In truth, the men who carry out these savage acts serve no higher goal than their own desire for power. They accept no God before themselves, and they reserve a special hatred for the most ardent defenders of liberty, America and Israel. Those words were spoken. Those words were spoken in 08. I believe they're relevant today, and I believe they'll be irrelevant relevant for the next decade. The men on the stage understand those words. They're soulmates when it came to the defense of liberty, and I'm honored to be in their midst. Our nation seems to me to be lurching toward isolationism. The tendency to, to, the tendency to say, these aren't my problems, they're somebody else's. But I'm confident that the Conference of Presidents will do its best to remind our country that we're a good and compassionate nation, a defender of freedom, a defender of Israel, and a proponent of peace. Your organization is vital today, it'll be vital tomorrow, and I'm honored to be in your midst to celebrate your successes. Thank you for having me. God bless. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.